is Friday, March 3rd, and you've reached Profiles and Perspectives with Darswell Rogers. Uh, welcome to the program. I'm very pleased to have uh, with me, and we are remote today, uh, Miss Simone Pemberton. Um, she is one busy woman. Let me just go ahead and start with that. She is currently the chairman of the Cumberland County Human Relations Commission, and she's currently serving as chair and was actually recognized by the commission just last month as commissioner of the year. She also founded uh, back in 2020 a, a nonprofit called brighterstill.org. And it's a charitable organization that provides free on-demand on -demand life skills training for those transitioning from homelessness, individuals re-entering society, youth, and just other interested community members. And she's also in the real estate business. She's a real estate broker. And so, uh, and she's got such a tremendous commitment to other community related activities. And we actually serve on the City View News Fund board together. So Simone, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's start with uh, Human Relations Commission. You know, it is not a activity or the sort of, um, of a program that I would necessarily have known that a community would have as a standing uh, a committee. So can you please exp explain what the Human, Human Relations Commission does? Yes, well, many cities actually have, or most cities, well, I should say many cities have a Human Relations Commission. So it's one of the, the boards and commissions uh, for Fayetteville and Cumberland County. And we handle anything related to um, equality, race relations, um, the betterment of the community, um, uh, pretty much anything that, that helps the community as far as anything related to human relations. So that could, that could cover so many different things. There's also a tie to fair housing. Uh, there's a tie to uh, some of the ordinances that are in the city. So uh, it's a very broad, uh, broad uh, spectrum of what we do. So can you give us some some kind of specific examples if there's something right now that you all are dealing with or something recently that would really resonate with people to say, oh, okay, I, I, I totally get where their where their focus where their focus is. Well, uh, one of the one of the more popular items that's been going on the last two years is the repurposing of the market house. So that was a big discussion that's gone on in Fayetteville for years. And uh, city council, I believe it was, goodness, I think it was in August of, I may not have the date right, but I think it was August of 21, it might've been 22, that, that city council agreed to have it repurposed. This is after we, the, the commission, uh, talked to the public and had forums and surveys and all these different things to get the voice of the community to decide whether to, or how to repurpose it. Prior to that, the city council had already decided that it was going to be repurposed, not torn down uh, and not relocated. So once it was decided that it wasn't gonna be relocated or torn down, they charged the commission to speak to the community, find out how it should be repurposed. And that's what we did. So they finally approved, uh, at first it wasn't approved uh, what we opted to do. Uh, so we had to go back to the community, get more voices, still the same responses from the community. So they approved it and we're in the process of, of doing that repurposing as we speak. So for those listeners who may not fully understand the whole notion and the history around the market house, let me just provide you a little bit of uh, benefit. The, the market house is, is the building here in town that actually, uh, I, I suspect was probably the initial capital of the state of North Carolina. It certainly was where this, the University of North Carolina was founded. And it was also the place in town where if going back, you know, back during slavery days, if you were selling anything, any sort of product or service, that's where you would go and sell it. So if you were selling uh, fruit, vegetables, or a human being, that would be the location that you would sell it at. And I wanna make the distinction that it was not a slave market. It was not in effect selling, that was not its primary function. It was just a farmer or some sort of business person wanted to sell something, this is where they would do it. And so as a result, 
there's been a lot of sensitivity. There's been a lot of conversation. There's a lot of been a lot of unhappiness about, uh, and this goes back decades and decades and decades in terms of exactly um, how how do you handle this? And it's just been a flashpoint for a lot of years. So. With that as a backdrop, I'm hearing that the decision was made to repurpose it. Tell me a little bit about where we are in that since that's the decision and, and, and what the Human Relations Commission's uh, role is in the ongoing activity. Well, we're working with architects right now. So part of, part of the challenge for the community is to know that even though you don't see anything happening, in front of you, there's a lot happening on the background. So uh, we, from the moment that we got the approval, we started working with the different groups. So it takes architects, it takes historians, it takes the art community um, and, and many more than that. So where we are right now is we have, I'm not sure how much I can release yet. Uh, so I'm gonna be careful with my words, okay. but, but we, I recently actually was part of a meeting uh, or a presentation, I should say, with with some of the architects uh, that were showing us drawings of what the area could become. So that's where we are right now. At some point in the near future, I'll be presenting before city council and just kind of giving an update, but some other things have to be done first. What we're doing first is the ADA compliance Right now it's not compliant. So if someone is differently abled, if they need wheelchair access or if they're site limited, um, any of those things need to be accounted for in whatever we do. So that's the first thing we have to do before we say, okay, and then we'll put some art features and some, um, um, I don't wanna say museum-like features because that's not what it is, but educational um, uh, points there. Uh, so it's not confirmed everything that's going there yet, publicly confirmed, but um, we are going to be having other conversations after after the ADA compliance is approved and underway. And again, so more to come very soon. More to come very soon. And for those who, again, who are not familiar, uh, uh, the, the, the other additional real dynamic of the market house is that it is really a marquee building in the middle of downtown. There's a the main circle if you're, if you're going from one side of the main part of downtown to the other, you have to go around a circle where the market house is there. So it's, it's a very prominent building. It's not something that's kind of off to the side and, and people are not aware of it. You, you can't, pretty much can't miss it. And it's, and it's, a, and it's a architecturally a very attractive, attractive building. Uh, so so um, from, again, sticking with the commission, how many commissioners, um, and, and that was a real flashpoint example you gave, right? But, but you know, you, you mentioned a lot of other things. I just want to make sure that people get a, a kind of a full sense of, 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 uh, of, of what you all are doing. Well, another, a few, just to show you how broad what we do is, we just had an event, I believe it was uh, two weeks ago, that, that um, celebrated some other people in the community who were doing great things. So we had a lot of elected officials there. We had the mayor there, mayors there, uh, mayor of Spring Lake as well. The mayor pro tem of Spring Lake was there. Many city council members, former commissioners. So we had, and I'm missing people, I promise you, but it, the room was full of people and we were celebrating regular community folks that including a little seven-year-old girl who were doing impactful things in the community that, that we wouldn't normally hear about. It was a paid event, so you had to pay, unless you were an honoree, you had to pay, I think it was $25. But the funds that came from that go to, towards a scholarship for the youth. Um, so, and, and that's unrelated to anything else I do. This is strictly a commission thing, and it's an annual thing where we give out scholarships every year. A lot of people who, have, who are familiar with the commission, that's generally what they thought we did before the market house information came out. Another example is we had, uh, I believe it was two months prior or maybe a month prior, we had a vision resource dine and dialogue. So we have several dine and dialogue or dining and dialogue events per year. And basically what that is, is we, we take an issue, whatever that issue is, and we serve lunch and we talk about how to solve whatever that issue is. Or it could be an awareness campaign. Uh, in this case, we met with the vision resource center who um, does incredible work in the community in Cumberland County 
um, for those who have sight limitations. So that's complete blindness, partial blindness. It, it looks at what their experience is in the community, what needs to be done to help them. And at, as a result of that, certain ADA, um, certain areas that needed more consideration are, are being changed. And this is just in a very short period of time. So that's, that, is very different than the market house, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really anything that improves the lives of, of community members, brings awareness to inequalities and, and areas that in a community we wouldn't think about. You know, we wouldn't think that you need sound at a crosswalk, you know, for someone, if, you're, if you have, you know, normal sight, you wouldn't think of how important it is to have sound at a crosswalk because if you can't see and you you can see partially so you can be mobile you can walk around and see but if you can't see certain things if you can't see certain colors um the sound will tell you or can't see certain distances the sound will tell you when it's clear clear to go and that's just one example there were so many examples um but that it, to, to the point of what you were talking about that's that's part of how broad we are and it gets even more broad than that that's awesome. So what I'm pulling, extracted from this is that you are the voice for those that may, in some respect, not have a voice, at least not have the ability yeah. to bring their voice to, to the elected officials that really should be serving those populations. And, and so, you know, advocacy, uh, empathy, uh, and, and, and a voice. That's right. Um, that, that's often. So how long have you been on the commission? And again, to tell me a little bit more about, about, you know, how large is it? And it's Fayetteville and Cumberland County. So you're actually some supporting not just your, your, and I'm not sure why it's not just county versus Fayetteville or Cumberland County, but that, we don't have to cover that necessarily because if you're covering the county, you're covering the county, which includes Fayetteville. But, but uh, just right. uh, um, um, a little bit about, you know, who's on there? How do they get on there? If somebody was, because this is a community activity that anyone who does certain steps could at least can be con considered for, correct? That's right, that's right. So the commission, I, I can't tell you the exact number right now, um, but the commission is generally made up, I think of 14 or 15 people. Um, the reason why I can't tell you the exact, exact number is because some terms are expiring and we had some open seats. Um, the seats are filled by appointment. So they're either appointed by the county or appointed by the city. So it's, it's a collaboration of both. Um, the city, there was just an appointment meeting. So I don't know how many were appointed. So that's why I don't know. Um, but basically to be involved, you just apply. You know, you, you go to FayettevilleNC.gov and go to boards and commissions and then you'll see uh, the Fayetteville Crumbling Human Relations Commission, you submit your application and then both the city and the county decide who, who is gonna represent that area. Generally, it's represented by district or if you're county, it's just rec represented by county. So anyone in Hope Mills or in any other area that's not covered by a district could be uh, considered for county and then anyone who, who is actually in the city of Fayetteville would be considered for the city. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I want to take a step back now or, or, or more broadly talk about the sort of work that you're doing. You've got a real community focus and a real community uh, commitment, which led you to create uh, a 501c3 nonprofit called Brighter Still in 2020. So uh, and, and I don't, instead of jumping right into Brighter Still, tell me what was the evolution that led you to decide that this is something that you wanted to take on? Good question. So, you know, I don't, I can't say that there was a flashpoint or anything that, that, that truly marked my decision to, hey, go do this. Um, but I do think I'm a firm believer that all of us have the capacity of doing something. You know, we can, we can see where there's a need and, and maybe you can't take on everything, but there are certain things that, that can come easy for you to do. Um, my, my trade is um, instructional design. So I also do instructional design for at and which for those who don't know, it's kind of graphic design when you're teaching. Um, it's training courses, it's things like that. So I'm, I'm graphic design and instructional design. So for me, it, it's easy. I've been doing it for 20 plus years. It's not that hard for me to do. 
And when I was working, I was also working with the Continuum of Care uh, for Cumberland County, that's just often known as the COC. And uh, it was a lot of homeless conversations. And um, my sister and I were, were out serving because we served at a regular interval. We were out serving and saw all these kids getting, getting off the bus. And it was like a lot of them, like and I say kids, they were, they look like older teenagers. Um, so we asked someone, you know, who are they? And they said, oh, they're foster youth, youth out of age out of foster care. So we realized that there was something, and I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit, but we realized there was something to that, um, that there was something that they needed just like the rest of us to get started and get flowing. Um, but backing up just a tad, so when we were when we were out there, we were also working with some others, just mentoring, just talking, just 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 being there and meeting a lot of the homeless people that were there. And we found that there were things that they needed and things that they were asking about. So that's kind of how the evolution of how it came together. I already knew that I could create content. I already knew um, also that I had limited time <laughs> to help um, a lot of people face to face, but I knew that there's also an online uh, presence that most people have. So you can run into homeless and they have cell phones with data, uh, they get it for free. Uh, so they have access to certain things. And if they're not, if they're not ready for, for certain conversations, because um, they're, you know, there are other things that are more important than how to buy a car, you know, I mean, they want to know how or have a grocery shop, they're looking at some other uh, more critical, more critical things. Uh, but whenever they are ready, they had the information right there. So we just kind of talked them through whatever they needed at the moment, but then kind of directed them, hey, whenever you need, whenever your life transitions a little bit, or when your need changes, or when you just want to learn about how to interview for a job, or, um, you know, how to dress for an interview and, and where to go for certain supports, then you can go to this website and then it'll give you some of that information. So when we aren't there with them, they'd, they'd have that, that information. So that's kind of where it started. I knew I could put together courses uh, relatively quickly. And then I knew I was already supporting this group. And I knew that there were youth that were coming, you know, basically getting off the bus and they were instantly homeless. So uh, that's, the long answer to what you said. I probably went around the world with that, but um, that's kind of no, it, 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 it actually was spot on. And I'm, I'm going to want to circle back on the, uh, on the question of the sort of programs that you have. Uh, we're, we're talking to Ms. Simone Pemberton. She's the founder of Writers Still. It's a 501c3 that provides free on-demand on life skill training. Um, and she's also chair of the Fayetteville Cumberland County uh, Human Relations Commission. The, 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 this, this idea of people who are transitioning out of foster care, that's probably not a group of, of people that folks think about very much. So can you just kind of explain a little bit more about what that means and the implications are for those young people? So for them, um, you know, sometimes when, when with foster care, not, yeah, sometimes with foster care, they're just housed um, and then, but not really taught a lot. So when they get out of foster care, when they age out, if they haven't done certain programs that are, that are done through the social services, and I don't know all the details of it, so I don't want to, um, you know, tell you incorrectly, but there are certain programs with social service where it, if they sign up, if they elect to do it, if the youth elects to do it, then they'll have a place to go after they age out. So after that 18 period, not everyone does that. You know, I don't know why, you know, or they're just regular teenagers who can wait to the last minute or whatever the scenario is, or it's something else. So if they haven't done that, then they're immediately homeless, you know, once they once they age out, you know, there's no way. And they age go. out at 18? You age out at 18? Um, I think it's 18. Yeah. So the, the other program that they have, I don't know the exact name. I think it's linked something, but um, it will cover them from, from that 18 to I think it's 24 or something. If, you know, certain conditions are met, uh, I may have that age wrong, but it's something like that. If certain conditions are met. 
there is there are there is support for them still. Um, they get educational assistance. They get all these different things, but they have to they have to do some of the work to make that happen. Um, again, I don't know the circumstances, but we just saw all of them. So when um, just moving ahead a little bit, when when one of the things that Brighter still is doing and had always planned to do is to have transitional homes for anyone um, in Cumberland County. And we were looking to do four of them. Well, when we saw, when my sister and I saw the, how many children or how many kids were off lot or getting off the bus and, you know, uh, immediately homeless, we decided to devote one of our houses to the foster youth or the foster girls or, or the youth that are aging out of foster care that are female. Um, and then next year we hope to do the boys, you know, because it's a different program. We got to get it right Absolutely. for the girls first and then we'll do it so, again. For so, the boys. so before I, I let you go, I want to take a break here at the bottom of the hour. We're going to come back. We're talking to Miss Simone Pemberton. She's the founder of Brighter Still, a, 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 a nonprofit focused on providing a free on-demand on -demand life skills for, for, for uh, folks. And she's also chairman of the uh, Fayetteville Cumberland County Human Relations Commission will be back after a break. And welcome back to the second half uh, hour of Profiles and Perspectives. And I am pleased to have with me, um, we're both remote today, uh, Ms. Simone Pemberton. She's the founder of, of a nonprofit, uh, Bright, brightersteel.org. It's a 501c3 that provides free on demand life skills training for those transitioning from homelessness, individuals reentering society, youth, and just other members of the of the community. Uh, she's also a um, the chairman of the Fayetteville Cumberland County Human Relations Commission and has a lot of other uh, community based sort of in interests. Um, uh, Simone, I want to follow up on your explanation of the training that you currently are providing. Um, you, you explain the fact that this is really your kind of your core skill set. And so can you, uh, um, and what I heard was that the training is kind of online so that whereby people can find it when they need it, which is the new, which is the new thing, right? The new thing is what they call asynchronous learning, which is it, the learning is there when you need it. Uh, and, and it's not being fed to you when it's not particularly relevant to you. So if you could can uh, spend some time on that, that'd be awesome. Sure. So the the training is, it's, most of it is video based. Um, so we have these, it's called micro learning, you know, where you can uh, kind of get the nuggets that you need to get within five minutes or less. Most of them are five minutes or less. Uh, multiple lessons in bite size, and that way it's easy to digest. There isn't a lot of reading. Uh, we don't know the, the reading level of those who would be using this. So we wanted to put everything with voiceover, with video, um, with heavy graphics. Um, some of the courses are, are um, contracted, if you will, by other groups. Uh, so USDA has some content that we also provide. Uh, USAA Educational Foundation, they gave us permission to use some of their content as well. So we have, we have some of their content posted as well. Um, and basically, like you said, they can learn on their schedule. And it's so short. I mean, if you look at the way society digests online content, they're in short, scrollable. Now, this isn't scrollable, but it is short to where they can, we can keep their attention span, you know, for, or their attention for as long as, as we can in, in short bits. And then it doesn't take a lot out of them. You know, if they are doing something, if they're going somewhere, you know, it's fast enough to go through a whole course in an Uber ride, you know, or, or whatever they're doing, you know, or a bus ride, however they're commuting. Um, so that's it, it's, it's convenient. That's, that's one of the benefits of it, it's convenient and it doesn't feel like they're sacrificing a lot of their time because truly there's no one there to motivate them, you know, to do this except for themselves. So we need to make it as easy as possible to learn some of the, the skills that they're after. So uh, my, uh, my logical next question is, okay, give me a couple of examples of some of the training that you all have developed. So we've got professional development. Now 
everything that just keep in mind everything that we do is on the basic level so there are things that we uh, assume that people know as adults we assume that they know but we have to keep in mind that people don't always know these things you know if they haven't been taught then they don't know it you know so we've got banking finance career um and and when i say career it could be how to interview you know what time to show up you know certain etiquette in interviews there was a in 2020 there were zoom interviews a lot and you'd see on camera and you'd see movement behind them during the interview you'd see a messed up bed you'd see um just any kind of clothes hair looking however so it kind of covered some of the etiquette that you need to you need to know and if you don't know it you don't know you're doing anything wrong and you can't figure out why you didn't get hired so let's talk about okay what do you actually need to bring to the table for an interview um we've got budget basics we've even got um things about credit you know it, it a lot of lower income and this is not just lower income but we are focusing a lot of this towards low income there isn't there isn't always people aren't always taught the importance of credit and then how to navigate credit so credit is not bad you know uh, like credit cards are not necessarily bad but there is a rule to how you use it you know so if you get to a certain percentage you know you need to know that if you go charge this first of all you probably shouldn't if you can't afford it but if you're going to do it then if you hit a certain percentage well before your um limit then that that lender is going to think that you're you've overextended yourself and that's going to hit your credit score you know so it's kind of going through some of these things at a very basic level and explaining okay you've got to take this seriously this is your credit reputation this is your reputation um how you manage your money is your reputation you know it also can open doors for you it can also make things way more expensive for you if you haven't managed that money well and if you are in a situation where a lot of people were in 2020 where you got laid off or lost your job and and now you've gone in foreclosure and you're in a credit repair it wasn't anything that was due to mismanagement or anything like that we also can look into how to rebuild that you know because it's not always a situation of, of mismanaged funds it's just a life circumstance that kind of brought you um to where you are so so and that's I, just a couple really, we've, i'm sorry go ahead go ahead no, no, no. um okay we've got communication fundamentals we've got online safety uh we've got professional development wellness even uh, nutrition we don't hear a lot about about nutrition and lower income uh it's all about you know just buy you know just what's cheap and what's cheap is not always the cheapest uh it's also not always you know gonna Don't support be. your your health yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so let me let me step in here for a second because i want to backtrack to the financial side of it um i mm -hmm. you know as i think you know you know i'm in the restaurant business up in up in New York, and we actively um, seek to support people that are in reentry in terms of entry level jobs, right? Yeah. And and even you know with my clients down here in the in North Carolina, um, those regardless of education really aren't particularly savvy about money and credit. But let me start initially with those in reentry. One of the one of the things I found to be the most challenging when we've got a person whose circumstances have been different, and so they're coming into the workforce, I'm having to give them a physical check instead of them deposit the money in a bank. And I'm like, you're I'm going to give you this physical check, and you're going to take it to a check cashing place, and they're going to hit you with a significant charge. Do you realize? that this is costing you money for me to give you a physical check. Can we get you a bank account open? And the fight, the struggle, the discomfort, and in my view, and just going into the bank with your documentation to open an account is really significant. Can you speak at all to that, to that uh, resistance? You know, it, it's, it's so common. <laughs> it's so common. And, and really, I think it, it, it does have to do with education, you know, so if, if the parent, and I know this isn't always the case, but let me just, for the audience, it is not always the case. 
but this is what we see a lot of is in, in low income areas, um, if the parents weren't taught the benefits of a bank, they didn't teach their children the benefits of the bank. Or if the parents had a fear of banking and just kind of, no, I'm not putting my money there, they do this or they do that. Or if they didn't teach them how to manage that money, like if they kept overextending and then the bank shut down their account and then they don't want to use the bank because they'll take that money. You know, I mean, it, it all kind of ties in. There's so many different scenarios that we have encountered people saying, no, I don't want a bank account. But you're right, the check cashing places are in business to take your money, you know, and to take more. I mean, you're actually earning less because of the fees, because of all of those things. You, you've got less take home pay, you've got all of, and plus it's a, it's a different mentality as well, because it, it's really a mentality kind of situation. But, but yeah, it's, we have a course on it. <laughs> we have a course on it. Uh, we also have a course on some of the other things that are similar to that, which is not exactly, the same but like when you rent to own um furniture or things like that there's there's a fee if you do the the um what do you call it the payday payday loans uh that's another one that it's an incredibly high percentage i mean hundreds of percentage uh in interest which is illegal in some places that you can you can only go to a certain percentage but that percentage could be 500 percent 700 percent depending on the state law so it, it is incredible. So it really just comes down to a person deciding <clears throat> that I want to change my financial life, <laughs> you know, and then finding out how to do it and then just, just doing what you're comfortable with, but, but doing it, you know, just, you still have to do it. It's, it's easier these days to set up a bank account. You can set up an account online with a reputable bank, let me say it that way. Um, you can set up an account online. It doesn't require a whole bunch of paperwork. You can also do it by phone. You do have to validate certain things, but you know, once you've done it, you've done it. And then that's it. You, I mean, you can't save really if you don't have a bank account and, you know, I just save effectively. And one of the things we know is, is that if you've got your money in your hand, it's a lot easier to spend it. Yeah. Uh, we, we also, I, I just want to offer up a, one or two cautionary tales here you do want to decide what bank you go to because some also have some pretty steep fees uh going yeah. back to these payday lenders and the like back in the day we call that loan sharking when and and so basically what the what the what uh, certain people did was they c constructed legal loan sharking loan sharking and and so the pay payday lenders and the like something that used to go to uh the mobster, for lack of a better way of describing it, to get a loan, they've now structured it whereby there are quote unquote legitimate companies that are charging you more fees than the guy, than the gangster would have charged you. Uh, I'll offer up just given my banking background, I'll offer up um, just one other perspective. Um, the African American community, if you go back all the way to the time um, right after the end of slavery, has had a horrible experience with bank failures um and i won't i won't spend a whole lot of time on that but there but but i'll, I'll share one story right after the right after the uh right after uh the civil war they created a freedman's bank that, that kind of t connected to the freedman's bureau and they used abraham lincoln and ulysses s grant's faces as kind of a validation that the that this was a reputable solid institution and initially it was and it was where most of the freed slaves put their money afterwards and then it eventually got into the hands of a bunch of speculators because let's face it there weren't african americans that really had the knowledge to run a bank it ended up with a bunch of speculators who lost all their money and literally wiped out the savings that the freedmen had accumulated following the civil war and there's a series of these stories that kind of take us well into the 20, 20th century. Uh, so there is some history, you know, when you talk about generational trauma, and it's just dawned on me today that maybe that's tied to banking as well. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that I have some folks right here in our community that would love and need to have some of that financial literacy 
in, insight that you got on brighter still. So we're going to have to circle back <laughs> and talk about how we provide some some support some support there. Um, you, you so so you've got brighter still. You mentioned in your literature that you're kind of focused on a real estate component to this. Talk a little bit about what the future holds in terms of what you're planning. So initially, at the very infancy of Brighter Still, before the courses were there, the purpose of Brighter Still was to have real estate um, and to provide transitional homes. And then in the period of time that we were waiting to develop the, the real estate component, that's where the life skills came in. And it's a nonprofit, so it kind of fell in there. It made sense that it would still be a part of it. So that we kind of paused on one not really paused, but we kind of started something else while we were working on some a longer term goal, which is the housing. Um, so Brighter Still Homes, it's, it's called a Bright House. Um, and the Bright House, we plan to have four, at least four in Cumberland County. And I say at least four, because it may be more than that. And then we go, we go further out. But um, basically it's just transitional homes. The first two, like I said, would be devoted to foster or youth aging out of foster care. And then the other two would be for whatever segment of population that needs it, um, that Cumberland County says, hey, this is a, a, a group that needs a home right now. So I don't, they're not designated. But it's, it's similar to the Ronald McDonald House, if you've ever seen one of those. So Absolutely. So it's, it's got, yes, yeah, so it's got individual rooms. It's not a group home individual rooms it's got a group kitchen it's got a group uh, or communal kitchen and communal living space little computer lab um generally it's got land around it with gardens and and they just stay there so the one for the youth is uh for the girls anyway the plan is to have them stay up to 24 months while they're transitioning of course there are a whole bunch of requirements in order to be eligible to stay in this house but uh, we support their transition to adulthood, you know, and kind of give them the intensive uh, mentoring that they need and life coaching that they need uh, to get to become successful adults. And by successful, self self sufficient adults is really what I mean by that. So they would have employment, they would have uh, internships if they need it. They would have, of course, the educational um, part of it. They would have the mentoring. And then other groups in the community, other nonprofits in the community that provide services that that would support them or that would uh, complement their lives, then we are inviting them in. We're definitely not about just brighter still doing things. It's really we can all get together and and create a win, you know, for for these individuals that need it. One of the reasons why we said yes to the the youth aging out of foster care is because the statistics they're not great um, for those who don't have support after they've left, you know, state care. So 50, 54% or something like that were unemployed. After five years, they were unemployed. Um, for the males, I believe it's somewhere up in 75% within five years were in prison. The women or the girls were almost immediately pregnant or within within six months, I think it's the time frame that they would be pregnant. Um, 60% of the women ended up in the sex industry. Uh, there, there are just so many stats that, that point towards a downward um, trajectory for their lives. Um, only 8%, and this is, this is a rough number, but only 8% actually went on to complete their education. So most fail is right. what, what that story tells. So that's why if, if we've got some way that we can, we can intervene, it's still up to them. They still have to do the work but we're supporting them in, in, in their efforts to do that work and providing the housing. It's affordable housing, so they still have to pay rent because you still have to know how to manage your money. You still have to know how to pay a landlord, but it's affordable housing, and then we can also give them other support that they're gonna need because most of them have trauma. You know, Most of them have issues, and it's not just gonna be us. This would also be in partnership, uh, or our hope anyway, would be in partnership with social services and um, you know, other groups as well. So we're talking to Ms. Simone Pemberton. She's the founder of uh, BrighterStill.org. It's a 501 state 3 that provides free on-demand life skills training for those transitioning from homelessness, individuals, and re-entering society, youth, and just other members of the community. 
She's also chair of the Cumberland, Fayetteville Cumberland County Human Relations Commission. Uh, we've got about three or four minutes left here, Simone. Um, I, I, I'm curious about, like, I could go a couple of, two or three different ways. Uh, one is, so in your free time, uh, I know you do a, a lot of other activities. We could spend a minute talking about the news fund, uh, or if there's something that you want to share with folks about uh, Brighter Still or human relations. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm opening it up for you to, to take this where your where your thoughts are at the moment. Well, um, we're always looking for partners for Brighter Still, so um, especially people that that are in the meal space, you know. So anyone that can teach how to how to prepare nutritious meals and um, meal planning or whatever, anything. So we're always looking for partners. So if you want to uh, reach us, you can go to www.brighterstill.org.org um, and just reach out and we'd love to connect. As far as our my free time is concerned, I'm working on adding free time into my life. <laughs> so I don't do it very often. Uh, but I do enjoy spending time with friends and family. Uh, generally, it's a spontaneous kind of thing. Just, hey, what are you doing right now? Nothing. So uh, that's how generally how I connect with friends. But uh, my family and I are really close. I'm blessed with a, a great family. So I spend um, whatever free time I have with them. Awesome. So, and I'll, and I'll just then add in that uh, that the City View News Fund uh, was stood up kind of in a formal way with a board at the end of last year and uh, its focus is to provide um, objective, just the facts, ma'am, sort, of, uh, sort of news uh, with an initial focus on our municipal government because they were not being actively, actively uh, covered by, by our local newspaper anymore, given the dynamics that's played out in the news business. And so that's been uh, kind of an interesting activity. We're just kind of really on the front end of that. I guess we've had maybe three board meetings. So, uh, and so, you know, that's that's the one kind of co collaboration point where Simone and I have had a little bit of a uh, little, little bit of interaction. So I just want, you know, I had Tony Schiavone on uh, a few weeks back to talk about the news fund. I wanted anyone who is not getting the City View news fund, it should show up in your in your email every single morning um, around six o'clock. And it is really. If you want to have, and if you're in the Fayetteville Cumberland County area, if you want to have a real time, what the heck is going on in our governments, local governments, then that's really going to be the primary news source. Uh, I, I want to, I want to say positive things about the paper, but it's just a little bit slower in terms of its coverage. Um, any, any thoughts there, Rob? Before I, we, we call it quits here. No, <laughs> I agree 100% with everything you just said. 100% with what you just said. So I want to thank uh, Simone Pemberton, and again, it's Brighter Steel, B R I G H T E R S T I L L dot org. I suspect you can go there, and, and let's just go ahead. Are you also taking contributions from others, uh, financial contributions and support? We are, we are, and at that same website, at the very bottom of the page, there's a donate button. You can donate that way through PayPal. Perfect. Listen, everyone, we've come to the end of our hour. Thanks so much to Simone Pemberton for joining us. I hope everyone has an outstanding weekend. You listen to Profiles and Perspectives with ours, Will Rogers.